If Apollo was NASA's prime, and Mercury its infancy, then it could very well be said that the Gemini Project, which ran from 1963 to 1966, was the adolescence of American spaceflight. Long since the days of a one-manned vehicle that orbited the Earth in lonely vigil, the Gemini spacecraft seemed almost like a sports car. It held two astronauts, it could change its own orbit with onboard thrusters, and it had nearly three times the amount of maneuvering fuel that Mercury did. On top of all of this, it was equipped with state-of-the-art computers and programming to aid in the upcoming objectives that NASA wanted to tackle for their future flights to the moon, specifically rendezvous. It had mechanical doors that could be operated in space, and its cabin was reminiscent of a fighter jet, so it was naturally attractive to the nine new astronauts who were eager to get their first shot into space. The astronaut class of 1962, or simply the new nine, was the graduating class for many of the astronauts who would later go on to gain fame in Apollo. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Jim Lovell, Michael Collins. These are just a few of the names that history buffs everywhere default to when thinking of the golden age of manned spaceflight. The first manned mission of Project Gemini was Gemini 3. Its crew would consist of one rookie and one veteran, Commander Gus Grissom, and pilot John Young. Gus would be making his second flight into space. He first flew aboard Liberty Bell 7, and his capsule sank to the bottom of the ocean, so as a good luck charm, he and pilot John both decided to name Gemini 3 the unsinkable Molly Brown. After Gemini 3, NASA barred the naming of spacecraft by astronauts until 1969. On March 23, 1965, Gemini 3 was given a go for launch. Its three-orbit mission, lasting just over the space of four hours, would test the spacecraft's systems required for future, more complicated missions in the program. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, ignition, and we have a liftoff. We have a liftoff at 24 minutes after the hour. The clock has started. Roger. Flight Econ kept rising very nicely. Captain Bird is climbing. Get. Go. I count 60 seconds. T plus 60 seconds. That boost is flying at a speed of 658 miles an hour. The crew is pulling approximately two Gs. They are now going through the area of max Q. Maximum dynamic pressure is exerted on the vehicle. The launch went perfectly. The first two orbits of Gemini 3 went without a hitch, and after diagnosing some minor leaks in the RCS system, the astronauts began testing food to see whether or not it would be suitable for future flights in the Gemini program. John Young displayed his obvious content for this plan, and produced a corn beef sandwich that he smuggled onto the flight sometime during boarding. Although he was reprimanded for this, nothing could subtract from the perfect performance given by Molly Brown. As retro fire came up, the astronauts admired their home planet below. After only four hours, it was already time to go home.
Racing through the atmosphere at more than 15,000 miles an hour, the heat shield of Molly Brown quickly rose to a temperature nearly a quarter that of the surface of the sun. Because of an error with the Gemini 3 onboard guidance computer, Gus Grissom flew the re-entry manually. As a result, Gemini 3 landed 40 miles short of the intended landing target, and when the drogue parachutes deployed, the capsule was jerked so violently that Gus Grissom cracked his faceplate glass on the control panel. This, alongside a potential RCS leak in the cabin, caused the astronauts to leave their helmets on opposed to ordinary procedure. However, this was not something that could sour the success of Gemini 3. The mission had demonstrated and evaluated the performance of the Gemini spacecraft and cleared it for multi-day missions that were to come. On Gemini 4, Jim McDivitt and Ed White would spend nearly four days in space. NASA had their work cut out for them. However, the success of Gemini 3 gave NASA reason to be optimistic. Soon, Titan rockets were rolling off of Air Force production lines like sausages and crews were simultaneously training daily at NASA facilities in the hope to perform up to five flights a year. Molly Brown, however, did exactly what she was meant to do.